So, welcome once again. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed that the room is as full as it is. We actually had to turn people back because uh, the course was fully booked. We couldn't have crammed any single more seat into the room. And that's um, quite astounding because initially last year, if Michelle remembers, we had a discussion on whether this course would even fly, whether there would be enough interest in it. Um, and as, as you see, there's so much need for looking at data in new and intelligent ways. Um, <clears throat> what, what I take home from your introductions is not only that your data is big, uh, you all have very similar data, and you all have data that you wouldn't even have thought about uh, five years ago. So we're right in the middle of the next revolution in um, quantitative biology, um, where the field once again becomes data driven and it becomes ever more important to handle it. And it's not just that the data is big, the, the you know, RNA seq data, as, as you know, is, is uh, uncomfortably big in, in many cases. Uh, but that's not the problem. We can easily teach computers how to work with big data if it's just more of the same. The problem is really um, in integrating data in different ways. Uh, your data is diverse. You have numeric data, you have genotype data, you have gene symbol data, so that's text data. And the big challenge is to get all of that together and to make inferences across different data types and handle them. And this is traditionally one of the fields where spreadsheets are really poor. And this is where you really need to work with programming languages. Now, unfortunately, it's, it's been said, I don't know if this is still true, but that biology uh, is the field that you get into if you uh, love science, but you can't stand math. And I don't know if this is true for many of you, um, or of any of you at all, but I find very often that, that people who take the workshops here take the workshops because there's a little bit of an, an anticipation, the rear against um, just starting to program and seeing what happens next. And this is really what I'm trying to overcome here. Um, this is going to be very, very interactive. Uh, I have not as much canned material at all as I, as I often have. But what I'd like you to leave here with is the idea that we can formulate biological questions and you can structure them in a way where we can teach a computer how to do that, which is program. So we'll talk a lot about how to look at a question so that we can work with it in R, and then how to do it even if you don't know R. And that's important, as we'll discuss later, because really nobody knows R. R is much too big. That's, this is one of its big, big shortcomings. So right, this is going to be a lot about uh, wrestling with R, and this is the theme of uh, a little introductory image here. <clears throat> so the learning objectives, Michelle always makes me write down explicit objectives. Um, <laughs> be able to set up an R project. We'll talk about how to structure files on your on your disk and where they go and and, and uh, how how to make um, a sane R environment. <coughs> Be able to structure a computational task as an R script. Uh, read, select, filter, rearrange, and combine data. Uh, be able to write functions and programs. That's really the important part. And be able to create simple analysis and also know where to get help. So when I started this course, <coughs> uh, developing this course, uh, just by habit, I, I took a kind of a textbook-like approach. Um, and the result was pretty much very similar to what you might have gone through on the R tutorial um, where you got the link. Now, I would actually need to know, so don't be, be ashamed. No, let's turn it around. Who has spent more than two hours on the R tutorial on, on my wiki? OK, who has spent more than 30 minutes on it? Okay. 
So for some of you, R is really, really, really completely new. And the approach uh, that we're taking today is maybe less structured than you would often like it if it's really, really, really completely new. So we'll take things slow, but if you find yourself getting lost, it's really important that you access Catalina or David and or myself, and we resolve things that you're not clear about. Because you'll need to be programming in R from the very first moment, or writing R and using R. And we're not just going to, I'm not going to try to tell you things that you can memorize in any particular way, but I'd like you to get active. It's like learning a new language. You can study vocabulary all you want, but really to learn it, you'll have to speak. And this is what we're going to do. So instead of looking over constants and vectors and tables and programming and plots in a structured way, I threw this all out. What we're going to do is very different. Because you don't want to become programmers. You might need to know that if you study programming in computer science. But you want to get some biology done. And R currently is really one of the most important tools for that. But what you're really worried about is how it's quite different things. How do I even start expressing my idea, ideas in code? Um, <clears throat> when I see questions on the R help mailing list coming up, I think 90% of the problems could be easily solved if people would spend more time on structuring their ideas and thinking about what it means to make something computable. We often have this reflex, okay, I have a pile of data, I have a data file, and now I'll take that data and I'll ask on the internet, how do I analyze it? Well, that's not a good question. Having data and then wanting to analyze it is not, is not a question at all. The question needs to be motivated by biology. The question needs to be something like, how is a certain value distributed in my data set? And then we can start asking, how do we, take, how do we generate a process that answers the, the particular biological question? Well, you might wonder, how do I even get started? Um, I've, I've heard some ideas here that everybody around us is using R and we're not using R yet in the lab and that's scary. So let's get started somehow, but how and where? Then you maybe do a Google search for R and you get 17,300 um, pages and often they're very good. So the important links are usually always on the first page these days. But still, it's, it's very intimidating. R is large, the R community is large, so whenever you ask a question, you'll have a lot of answers. Oh my god, something happened, what do I do now? You'll, you'll do the first thing in R and before, and you think, you're, you think what you're doing, you, th you think you know what you're doing, and then R throws up an error message and refuses to go on. And the error messages in R, in R can be very, very, very arcane and have very little to do with what you think the problem might be and be not very helpful in actually solving the problem. So I hope we'll create a lot of error messages during this workshop and work through them and give you some level of confidence that things don't actually break. Um, and then, of course, how can I remember all of these functions? And there's a lot of R functions, but the idea here is really that shouldn't be the question. Um, <clears throat> there is way too much to remember if you want to remember it all. You should really be focused on the problem at hand. Um, you may need a few basic principles and understanding of principles to get started, but try not to start learning things by heart. Try expressing your ideas somehow, seeing how things go wrong, and then fixing it. And fixing it means looking it up, posting a search, and um, writing a search on the internet, you'll often find, ex well, usually you'll find very, very good answers for something and working from there. You'll get more proficient with practice. And you won't get proficient by studying textbook-like material at the, at the outset. So that's uh, what I hope you'll be more comfortable with when we go home. Let's see how it works, as it's a new experience for me as well as for you because it's a completely new course. So we learn R by working with R, and we look at a problem which is kind of typical, I think, of the problems we have and develop a strategy to solve it. And part of that strategy will involve R, but <clears throat> more importantly, part of the strategy will involve structuring the problem in the first place. 
And that, in a way, means learning how to learn. And with R, this is particularly important. The answer to can something be done with R is almost always yes. It's extremely versatile. Um, and not only is it extremely versatile, but many people have posted um, excellent and high quality computational solutions. Now, sometimes I find that a bit of a detriment. There's a very simple way to work with R and a very simple coding paradigm. And it's all about writing procedures and putting them together. And that's what we'll do today. But there's also rather more computer science oriented ways to do things in a very object oriented way with functional programming large in your mind and very efficient packages and subroutines that make work with big data um, very fast and very efficient. And this is not what we'll talk a lot about today because that's very problem specific and I think often it obscures the ideas of having to structure your work neatly and cleanly in the first place. So we're not at all about elegant R programming. And the paradigms that we'll be talking about today are also often not the paradigms of how to write code that you will find on the web and on the internet. We'll do something that's you know, very straight and I hope very transparent. And there's many, many good reasons to do that. Not least of all that, the more you can break things down visibly into single and individual steps, the more you can fix it if something goes wrong, and the more you can validate it as it goes along. And that's really crucial. The validation of your code and your programs is going to haunt you for the rest of your R career, and it should. It's easy to get a number, but it's not trivial at all to know that that number is A, correct, and B, meaningful and logical in, in the context that, that you've computed it. So <clears throat> here's what you'll need to do to get the most out of the day today. First of all, be active. Um, try to think ahead. Write in your computer. Don't just listen, but try to anticipate what's going to happen. And um, you should always think, how would I approach this problem? Make, make the problem your own. And think about how you would approach it, and think about if you don't know how to approach it, what's the question that I need to ask to be able to solve it? Take notes, take lots of notes, write a lot. A, this helps you focus. Um, you're not just, you know, my, whatever I'm saying or somebody else in the room is saying is not just passing through your mind. But if you write down and paraphrase things, you'll actually get it into your working brain what was, what was just happening. Ask. Ask a lot. I expect a lot of what we're going, most of what we're going to be do, doing today to be developed in dialogue with you, with questions and with, with proposals. If you don't ask, I will ask you. That's, that's often what we do in the, in the lecture room. And then finally, play. If I give you a certain command um, on the screen and you type that, why, didn't, why not change the parameters? See if it still works. See if it breaks. If it breaks, that's an interesting experience. Um, a, you learn what it looks like if something breaks, and B, we can perhaps discuss interesting ways to fix it. And I hope overall you'll enjoy all of this. So let's talk a little bit about biology, just to introduce a paper for which we're going to be asking the context. I am not at all an immunologist, um, so I have no background knowledge in this. This is as new to me as as it is to you, uh, most of you. Do we have any, anybody who works in um, uh, hem hematology in, in the room, immunology? Oh, wonderful. So we can go to you for, for more specific questions. <clears throat> anybody seen this paper before? Well, I, I emailed about it yesterday, but did you come across this? Massively parallel single-cell RNA-seq for marker-free decomposition of tissues into cell types. When I, when I saw this a week ago, I thought, gee, this is really interesting. Um, first of all, it's pretty cutting edge that we're actually able to do RNA-seq on single cells. So that's very amazing. And, but this is a massively parallel approach that does something um, 
which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, as you know, in immunology, one of the, the big topics is to describe all of the cells that have to do with the immune system, and there's many, 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 many different ones. And they have been characterized in many different ways, usually by expression of some cell surface antigen. Well, this is an alternative approach. But the approach is also general in the way that it possibly scales to looking at all different cells in, in our body. How many tissues do we even have? How many different cell types in the body? Well, that depends on how you look at them and how we distinguish them. And this is one way to do it. What, what these people did is they've, they've looked at gene expression levels by counting RNA-C transcripts, and then approached cellular diversity through inferring variable and dynamic pathway activity than rather looking at a pre-programmed hierarchy. So they looked at what these cells express and what these cells change during expression, and then asked, are there similarities? So you have a large number of cells. They all do their thing. You characterize each and every single one of them through expression levels of a large number of genes. And you also characterize them through the response to a stimulus, in this case, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which is a general inductor of immune responses, and see how their, their properties change. And that, I think, is very characteristic of many of the types of, of RNA-seq experiments that we're thinking about. You characterize cells, or you characterize tissues, or tumors, or patients with a large set of expression data in RNA-seq. And then you look at how things change. And the overriding question is then, well, if, this, if we see this status and we see the response, um, are there similarities among the cells? Are there similarities among the tumors or among our patients or phenotypes or whatever you're looking at? And once you define these similarities, you can then um, take this new knowledge and make biological inferences from it. So in a nutshell, what happens is, um, <clears throat> is, is there some, Michelle, is there some fancy high-tech pointer so I can do something on this screen and it'll show up? You can only, if you use your mouse, it will show up. My mouse will work? Is that visible? Yeah. yeah? Okay. I should have a laser mouse. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have spleen cells and we isolate single cells from the spleen and put them onto 384 uh, well microtiter plates and we lyse them and barcode them. So barcoding is the, the attachment of characteristic DNA sequences with which we can then identify in which pool of um, this um, microtiter plate uh, the cell was sitting or where the DNA came from. So in the end, when we throw all of this together, we can trace individual RNA-seq reads back to one specific pot in the microtiter plate, or trace it back to one specific individual cell. And this way, we can distinguish reads from individual cells through barcoding. So once we've done that, we can identify the individual RNA messages. We can pool them in a single cell pipeline. Um, we can amplify them, we can read them, and we can do some um, interesting analysis. Now, the interesting analysis turns out like this. Um, we have here a correlation map of cells against cells. All, um, I don't know, several thousand cells that went into this study. And what this correlation map does, it says, um, for all the genes that the cell expresses, do two cells have similar expression levels? And if the expression levels between two cells are similar, uh, we'll, we'll give them a red dot on this plot. And if the expression levels are different, we'll give them a black dot. So this is the correlation between them, all the gene expression levels for all of the cells. And then we arrange it in a, in a way that uh, makes it easy for us to see similarities. And what we get here is this block structure after rearranging this. What this block structure means is 
there are groups of cells among the several thousand cells that have been, that have been sequenced. There are groups that look very similar to each other, but different from other cells. So each of these dots is presumably thus one particular cell type or tissue type. And in this way, in a completely automatic fashion, we can start looking at how many different cell types or tissue types <coughs> exist in the sample that, that we looked at. And the researchers then went on and they, they did an experiment where they stimulated cells, which is summarized in, in this little plot here. Um, so the, the experiment here is after sorting cells and identifying them um, and assembling them into groups based on this, this initial discovery of correlations between individual cells, you stimulate them with LPS. Why? What's LPS? Can you give us a, a, a five-second primer on why we use LPS and what it does? I don't use LPS. No, no, I'm, I'm behind you. you you're, you're one of our immunologists, right? Um, can you say yes? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so we all have an innate immune response and a, a, a learned immune response. But if you give immune cells LPS, they think they recognize um, the presence of bacteria and they become active. So it's a general, non-specific stimulator of uh, an immune reaction. And some cells are expected to respond to that, and some cells are expected not to respond to that. So, for example, what we see here is um, B cells are characterized by having um, high enrichment of expression values uh, in these genes here, and there's no enrichment of expression values in this, these genes here. Um, but if you give them LPS, nothing happens. The highly expressed genes stay on, and the poorly expressed genes stay off, and LPS does not uh, induce them. Uh, macrophages, on the other hand, respond quite strongly. So there's this group of genes here, um, which are borderline or poorly expressed uh, under resting conditions, but they all become highly expressed when we add LPS. And monocytes, similarly, highly expressed here. Now, is there something that's generally known that um, macrophages and monocytes have in common that B cells don't? Well, they're, they're, they're from different branches of the hematopoietic uh, um, um, tree, the, the tree of descent from, from the hematopoietic stems, uh, stem cell lines, as they differentiate into the different branches of B cells or, 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 uh, or other cells. Um, these two come from, from uh, the same type of precursor cells. And so what we see here is that our knowledge about how cells develop and differentiate uh, is actually reflected in this behavior which did not go into building this knowledge in the, in the first place. So this, this kind of, you know, discovering these relationships was, was done without any prior knowledge of hematology. It just comes out. In fact, it says that we believe that these cells are, are similar to each other and different from others in particular ways, i.e. in that they respond to LPS, and lo and behold, if we do the experiment, we actually find that that's true, and that's actually... Um, quite encouraging if this happens from time to time in science. So, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's actually pretty neat, an automated way to distinguish cells from each other without any prior knowledge. And this is, of course, important because, you know, how do we, how do we know that our prior knowledge, our preconceived notions about how the body works are correct? It's much better if we have an unbiased, completely general approach, and then we can look into the data 
develop hypotheses and, and indeed find out that we were correct or generate new knowledge. For example, discover new tissue types that we didn't even know about or um, get new information about how tissue that we thought we knew very well actually behave, um, behave in practice if we have a closer look. So I hope this kind of thinking and this kind of approach um, resonates with the kind of questions that you're interested in. Now, at this point, we can start asking questions. So, for example, um, here's, a, here's a part of um, the, the resulting images here. Um, the, the researchers automatically classified the cells into different types and used a computational procedure um, to differentiate them. It's, you know, basically a, a type of cluster analysis and cluster plot. So what <clears throat> um, you, can, you can kind of think about, you identify the cells that have these expression patterns and then you find a way to, to plot them um, on, on some kind of a 2D plot whatever that plot is. Uh, the clusters here then correspond to um, the blocks that we saw or the gene cell enrichments that we saw. And in order to validate that, they then did a traditional flow cytometry experiment and characterized a few cells by flow cytometry and sequenced these two. So characterizing a cell by flow cytometry means you incubate the cell and then you throw some labeled antibody on them that recognizes some cell surface marker and then you send them to a machine that recognizes the labeled antigen and you make sure they land in different pots and then you can do something with them like sequence their, their uh, RNA and thus look at the expression levels. So for example if you do this with cells that are <coughs> CD19 positive and B220 positive, which are two antigens, um, and T-cell receptor beta negative, um, and then you sequence them, they all fall into this spot here on, on the plot from our initial unbiased analysis. So this means all these red dots correspond to known B-cells, because known B-cells would have this complement of surface antigens. And we see that these known B-cells actually cluster with one of the genes that we've uh, defined uh, one of the clusters that we've defined computationally from looking at all of the genes. So this means these surrogate markers here correlate with the internal state of the expression of many genes in our cells. And you can do this with sim uh, different markers, for example for natural killer cells which cluster into this spot very nicely or with plasmolytic dendritic cells, which cluster into this spot here, or with uh, monocytes, which don't cluster very well, but are, but are seemingly more diverse in, in their properties. And in every case, it seems that the traditionally known and described cell surface markers correlate very well with the clusters that the computational analysis stemming from RNA-seq has defined. Now, for example, we can then ask, well, are these markers actually expressed in the cell? Can we see that um, the cells which cluster into this group here have a high expression level of CD19 and B220? How would we do that? That's one question that we could ask of the data which, which has been published with the paper. <clears throat> We could study the, the, the uh, figures that they gave us very, very carefully and, and try to come up um, to understand their conclusions. For example, for all of the uh, genes that are in this plot here, every single line, every single horizontal line uh, corresponds to a single gene. We could then start asking, well, they've only labeled um, a small number here, but what are these genes overall? Can we, can we identify them? We'd be, for example, potentially interested in whether all these genes um, are co-regulated with each other and understand something about regulat regulatory networks. Um, 
So we can start asking these questions. But of course, the authors haven't labeled them. Can we get this information from the data which they have in the supplementary data? Or for example, we, we might see that there's a group here um, in, this, in this row uh, that doesn't have any labels at all. What, what are these genes? What do they correspond to? They all seem to uh, be highly expressed in the resting state and then switched off um, when, the, when the cells are challenged with an immune stimulus. So are these housekeeping genes that the, that the, um, that the cells need to switch off when, when, they get in, uh, when they go into their active immune state? Um, or are they active suppressors of immunity, which might be quite interesting? I, I don't know. But can we have a look from the data that's published? Well, that's, that may be an interesting question to ask. Or, for example, um, we see that there are clusters of cells um, <coughs> that express particular genes at a high level, and the question then might become, um, are these genes functionally similar or, or dissimilar? Are they actually co-regulated? Um, does the observation of um, significant patterns in the expression levels actually correlate with our knowledge about gene function? So, and so on. So there's a lot of questions, biological questions that we could ask, and um, I'd, I'd like to explore them with you in, in, uh, today. <coughs> but of course the major obstacle is um, we need not only to work with the supplementary data, but potentially uh, diverse additional data sources, and the data comes in very, very different formats. Much of the data you will find in Excel data sheets. Some of the data might be in the handwritten notes of your um, grad student, um, or simply in text files, or you might have to work with PDF files and extract data from PDF files, or go to uh, sources like the Gene Expression Omnibus uh, website of the NCBI that hosts microarray data or um, um, the gene co-expression database that uh, has analyzed um, gene expression data sets to find genes that are co-expressed with each other and so on. So a lot of the tasks that we have to do is have to do with um, data integration and the first task always is how do we even get our data in the computer in the first place. This is usually the most uh, significant and most resounding obstacle. So what do we do first? Well, let's ask this question here. Let's just try to download supplementary data from what the authors have worked with, get it into R, and then begin analyzing uh, something about the genes that are enriched for expression under different circumstances or are not enriched for expression. So the biological question here are the known markers of this gene expressed as expected. <coughs> um, so what how would you how would you uh, how would you attack this problem? What do we need to do? Um, Michelle, do you think we, we need both blackboards here? Can, uh, I, can no, I erase one of them? Yeah. Is there an eraser? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> oh, here. Thank you. How, how would you structure this question? Does it, does it even make sense? Was, was it clear what I'm asking here? How would you structure this? First, you have to introduce the morning inputs. Right? And, and then the problem of what are we looking at. 
uh, right. have to convert into the world. What, what are we looking at? Yeah. So what, what do you think we should be looking at? We'll see if we can find the data then, but what, what do you think we should see? The raw see. reads. That's what the counts, so the counts. For individual, well, this is a little different than the raw reads. You're, you, now, if, if you're looking at counts, you've already taken your raw reads and then you've associated them with genes. Yeah. Okay. So we, we would like to have expression codes. So in some way, that would be a long list of gene A, B, C, and P, Q, R, 2, and L, Y, 5, and whatever the 21,000-something or 25,000, if you include um, RNAs, <coughs> or many more if you look at differential splicing, or whatever these genes are, and then some value, 85 and uh, 42, of course. 11,358. So this is the type of data which initially we would like to see. Right? So genes and values. Yeah? I didn't mean to have a chance to read the paper, but I just want to be clear. The circular um, thingy that was up there before, the histogram? Yeah. The, the seven categories. So, so basically, it's it, the shade reflects the same thing. But the seven categories were the same as the, the cell types that we saw. Well, that, that's a conclusion that we have. Initially, this is just a data clustering approach. So you arrange data here for cells that seem to have similar expression profiles. And now you take markers for B cells, you select them by flow cytometry, and each of these B cells, which have then undergone the same uh, RNA-seq procedure, seems to have expression profiles which look similar to some of the clustered cells we've seen before. So from this we can make the inference that these cells which ended up in this cluster are also B cells, which we wouldn't know because we didn't label them with, uh, with cell surface antigens. Now the question I'm, I'm trying to pursue is to ask, well, is CD19, which is a B cell cell surface antigen, is that expressed, is that significantly enriched in this group of cells, or is it not? So it's a kind of a validation question here. Don't you need to also set some kind of threshold? Because for what you say is in their cluster, mm -hmm. right? So like if you look at the monocytes, they seem to be scattered all over the place. So you have to say, what's the cluster of monocytes? So if you're looking at B cells here, you have to say, are those ones that are sort of scattered down at the bottom, do you count those as B cells? Or can you set some kind of threshold for how close they are or how stuck they are into that cluster? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, but this would go very much into the, into the exploratory data analysis. Will, will you be here in the PDA workshop? <clears throat> in principle, um, the answer is no, we don't seem to be able to have um, complete sharp thresholds. We can just define some kind of boundary between what our algorithm has shown us to be similar data points. Um, but that's fine, because um, as the, the scattered plot here shows you, there's a lot of variation in the natural processes anyway, and it's not such that all of the monocytes will only look like this core spot here. But they will have different properties, and the differences may be as biologically uh, significant as the similarities. So with the B cells, it seems to be rather clear that they focus very well. With the natural killer cells, it's not so clear. There's a cluster which correlates with one of the things that we thus label to be NK cells, but some of them would be indistinguishable from monocytes were it not that we would be looking at the cell surface antigen. So the cell surface antigens are different, 
but by and large, it seems that their expression profiles, their enrichment is quite similar. So then we'll, we'll have to ask, well, these cells here, their, their expression profiles are similar, but what makes them different cells? What makes them want to believe one should be <coughs> reacting to LPS as a monocyte, and one should not be reacting? Um, and so on. So, but let's let's try to you know really approach this step by step. In order to ask very clearly, is CD19 highly expressed um, in a certain group of cells? Wouldn't you want that to be part of your <coughs> RNA seq? list of genes, you know, right. like primers. Right. So presumably in this list of genes you would find CD19 somewhere. And we'd like to know is it, what is its status? What's the number that we've associated with? <clears throat> and we'll have numbers associated with different individual cells, several thousand individual cells, and we'd like to ask are these numbers characteristic of the ones that we've grouped together? So what's the very first step that we need to do? Okay. Like trying to see if the genes that we know are upregulated in what we think are these cells cross cross over. Upregulated genes. Annotated as B cell. And we'd have CD19 somewhere in there. In principle, yeah, this is exactly what what we would be trying to do here. So <clears throat> asking if in the list of enriched genes or upregulated genes we can find CD19 and its expression level is high. So the very first step to do is we need to get the data into our computer. So, yeah. So there's when we get the data, we can let it cluster on its own, and then we'll put it into blue veins, like what David did there. We realized these are different immune cell types. Mm -hmm. Or you can force cluster with CD19. <laughs> so are you saying, I know it's CD19 positive? <clears throat> no, sorry, I may, I may not have been clear enough. Um, these red dots here are flow cytometric analysis after the other analysis. So this is a second step of validation. So, you've right? so initially, initially we have these, these black clusters here, and we've clustered the data, and now we're trying to validate what these clusters are. So we do a separate experiment, we label cells with antibodies, and we, we, we find those that we call B cells because they have the B cell characteristic antigen. And <clears throat> then we see whether the data we get in our B cells coincide with the clusters that we got from all cells. So this is the conceptual validation step that the clustering actually gives us something of biological relevance. Right. Initially, I can, I can cluster any, anything, as, as we'll see in cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is really easy. You take some data, and then you get clusters. But are they meaningful? Mathematically, in a sense, they are meaningful, but are they biologically meaningful? This is what this, this experiment is. Somebody else, we're confused. The cap X and the cap Y, what does exactly mean? Because I know it's a different, it, what's being plotted <coughs> You'll have to dig deep into the methods uh, supplementary analysis. Um, it's a special way of plotting these particular clusters. I haven't seen this previously. It's maybe something they developed for this purpose, or your friends in, in, in stats. Um, did, did you come across, you know, 
in this approach. So essentially, <coughs> you you identify clusters and you put the clusters um, on a circle, and you have some function that um, similar cells should come close to these points on the circle, and and cells that have uh, properties which are in between circles sort of fall fall in between. So it's just one way of putting one way of putting multi-dimensional data into two dimensions so that we can visualize it. Like principal um, Like the clusters that you would get after you do principal component analysis. Um, and you then plot things in two dimensions. Right? So this is super high dimensional data. I mean, this, each, each cell is characterized <coughs> by a vector of, you know, I, I don't know, <coughs> 1,300 different um, differentially expressed genes. Um, but we only want to plot it in two dimensions, so we, we get a nice picture and we can study it. Um, this is what this cap X and cap Y is for. Many other different ways to, to plot things would be possible here. Um, perhaps if we make good progress, we can just ad hoc try to develop one and take the data and, and look at it in, in a similar way. Right, so step number one is usually always to load the data. And actually, that's what we'll spend a lot of time on. And then step number two is to um, Identify data for one gene and print it out. Where this one gene could be different genes, not just exactly one, but maybe lists of genes or whatever. And then we can look at the values in our data set. So as far as computational procedures go, this one is simple. And we'll start with a simple one. And that's good. Now the question becomes loading data. And this is where we actually start are. Um, you can either work along um, in R or you can work along in R Studio. Um, for those of you on Windows machines, I would probably um, recommend R Studio simply because it has syntax highlighting um, that R has in the in, in, in the uh, Mac graphical un, uh, user interface anyway. So I'll probably be using the, the plain R interface, but the R Studio interface looks very similar. And ma maybe I'll just be switching to and fro between them. Um, <clears throat> right. Let me see. So this is where we actually start with the R code. Um, now, um, if you could go to the workshop wiki, And there's a file here, 2015 intro, module one, first steps dot R. Can you just increase that font? Absolutely. Thanks. This one here. And I would like you to save that to disk. Well, let's click on it first. Um, the first thing we need to do is, is um, we need to set up our workspace. Whenever we begin a new project, we, we probably should be creating a new directory and putting stuff and data into this new project. 
So somewhere on your computer, um, <clears throat> I would hope, that you've already installed or begin to install a directory which could be called cbw or something else, which is a subdirectory somewhere on your hard drive. Now, setting up a, a folder like this um, is the minimum, really, that you should do for any kind of a computational question that you have. Um, I would really never start working ad hoc, but getting the organization done at the beginning um, helps you a lot in structuring things so that you will ultimately find them and be able to reproduce them and, and work with them in the future. You can certainly enhance this later on, and you could do other subdirectories, which we won't do. So typically, one possible directory would be for data, where all your raw data files go, so they don't clutter your directory listing all that much. And there could be one separate directory for um, um, documentation and so on and so on <clears throat> but initially um, your you should have a project folder somewhere on your computer um, to work with Okay, and I'll do the same thing on my computer. I now have a folder here, which I've just called CVW. And um, when I open R Studio, I can then open a new project with our studio. And I use the choice existing directory, associated project with an existing working directory. And the project working directory is this one that I've just created.
Now, in your R tutorial, um, there was a little section on files that, that R uh, executes when um, it first starts up. And specifically, there's a file um, There's a file called R profile um, <clears throat> that sits in your home directory when you start up R and that executes things as R starts up. So for example, this is my R profile file. So in this R profile file, I can I can put things that um, that I want to uh, that I want R to remember all the time. So for example, one thing that I've did is I've changed the prompt for R, which is probably just one angle bracket for you. And in my in my R profile file. Um, has an R prepended to that angled bracket. So my R template here, uh, my R background looks a bit different from yours in that there's this R here which you don't have. The reason for that is that I've put that into my R profile file and when R starts up it reads the R profile file and changes the setting. Um, <clears throat> one thing that um, is useful in such a profile file is a shorthand notation for the actual directory where your R files sit. Um, not for the kind of work that we're doing here now, but later on when you will be uh, sharing scripts with collaborators. <clears throat> Everybody might have the same project files, but typically uh, the project files would be in different places on their computers. Now the first command that I always put into a script is an R command set WD, which you've probably come across in the, in the R tutorial. Set working directory. And this sets the working directory for R to be the folder where you want it to be. And that, it, that means if you open files or if you save files, they get opened or saved in this particular directory. And if you don't do that, R will not be able to find your files. So, but in order to do that, you need to define where your working directory is. Now, if I write C colon backslash R files backslash 2015 backslash microarray project backslash Boris Wild Ideas backslash R folder. This is going to be specific and correct only for myself. If I give that to my to my um, <coughs> collaborators, it won't work. <coughs> so it makes it awkward to exchange scripts. However, if we agree on a particular name for our project and we put that definition of where that file is on our computer um, into the R profile file that gets sourced on startup, everybody can use the same alias. 
So the alias that I've defined here is cdw dear. So if I put something like set working directory cbw dir, <coughs> I automatically get taken to the correct file. Now, if my collaborator would do the same command here, which I might have in a script, they also would be going to the same file. So none of this is, is crucial for what we're doing now, because, for example, if you use RStudio, um, we've defined what the project file is when we started it up, so RStudio will actually already take us to the, to the right location. Um, <clears throat> But it's good best practice, and it's the kind of best practice that's you know usually not documented somewhere. It's good best practice to work with in in, in a collaborative setting. So this is why I mention it, mentioning it here. So R starts, R executes your R profile, um, and some things might might happen um, in in that R profile. Question. Like in your case, after the one, it says user right. type. Um, exactly. So the tilde um, on Macs and on Linux computer is my home directory. Okay. I actually don't know if it's the same thing on Windows. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. So that's something that doesn't work generally for everyone. So this is this is already something that everybody would need to have specific to their. So on Linux computers and on Macs, the tilde is my home directory. Is there a default home directory for Windows? Uh, I'll just see. It's like uh, percent assigned home. Oh, percent assigned home? OK. So that, that would possibly work in an abbreviation. Okay, just making sure I'm now back again in my project directory. Um, <clears throat> so, you have a project directory, and um, it doesn't matter. Why? Let's let's maybe use our studio. So everybody has the same experience. Um, and I'll probably be using R. Well, we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll be switching between both. Um, <clears throat> good. So the first command that, that I'd like you to type is just get WD. And <clears throat> the result of that should be a string which points to the workshop directory that um, you've just set up. <clears throat> the next thing is to get this file um, this is just the file on the wiki that that we just went to so this intro module first steps um, access this first this file and get it on your computer so, so that we can load it and there's many different ways to download data files or text files from, from the web. One easy way would be to go to RStudio 
and to open a new file, an R script, and um, select all and copy and paste. So then the whole file is here. And when you've done that, <coughs> you see that this file name now is, or the tab label is red. The tab label turns red whenever you have changed something in your file. It's a reminder that you've changed something and you probably want to save it. So that's what we'll do now. We'll save it. Our studio is smart enough to not have us look everywhere on our computer, but to put us into our working directory. And we'll just call it um, First Steps Code. Try it. Good question. I suspect it won't work because I suspect that it won't automatically update the working directory definition in the project file which it sets up. So our studio sets up a project file where it keeps a lot of information about the project. Um, so I don't think that gets automatically updated if you move the file outside of our studio. But um, maybe it does. I've never done it. <clears throat> but if you, your folder is really in the wrong place, um, maybe the easiest thing is to just create a new one. Well, at that point, if you if you start reorganizing things, then just say file, new project, start a project in a brand new working directory, define that, and then once it gets created, copy your files over there. Okay. And now, very likely, if you close our studio and open it again, it will be in the right place when it starts up. It remembers the right place if you've been there before. <clears throat> the key at this point really is to issue the get working directory command and find that the result of that is the directory that you'll be using for the projects for this workshop.
You can then also issue the command list files. which tells me what files I have in that directory. It's just a, a directory listing. So something that's often a bit awkward is to find the right directory in the first place. And I'd, I'd, I'd just like to, to show this to you because it's, it's really neat. In the R um, interface, it doesn't work in the same way in, in R Studio, but if you um, drag and drop a script file into a new file in R. It interprets this as a command to source that file, i.e. to execute uh, the, the commands in that file. And part of that command is it expands uh, the full path of your directory. And you can then just copy and paste it from there. <clears throat> so Right. So, uh, as with many things, there's also a menu command to do that in RStudio. If you go on Session, Set Working Directory, you can set it automatically to the source file location <coughs> or choose a directory. And that's, of course, also a way to get um, a file, a complete file path, because I can choose any directory on my computer. And then after I've chosen that command, it gets me the full path. And so I know how my computer understands that particular string. It can be a bit tricky. For example, on <coughs> Windows computers, where file directories are separated with a backslash, that backslash has a special meaning in strings in R. It's an escape character. For example, if you, if you have the character N, prepend it with a backslash, this means new line, right? So <clears throat> in order to understand backslashes, therefore, um, in a Windows file, R needs to somehow specially handle this and, and know that these are not escape characters. So one thing, one way to do this is to escape escape character. So a double escape character is in a string just a backslash and not an escape character. So this string now is backslash n and that's what you would need to do to properly specify um, strings that contain Windows file paths. However, it's a bit easier because uh, if R recognizes this to be um, a string, a path, it will automatically translate it for you and 
do this as a forward path. So if you, if you say um, get WD on a Windows computer, do you have backslashes or forward slashes? Right? So forward slashes this way. But that's not actually the right syntax for Windows, because on a Windows computer, it is actually backslash. So R automatically translates this for you, uses the forward slash for all its representations. But when it issues a systems command, it, it actually issues the command in the right way, i.e. in a backslash way, so that the operating system um, um, understands it. So don't be confused by that. R, R is doing something automatically, which is actually helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I usually write setwd, whatever path, as the first command in my scripts. Now, using scripts. And that's a really important one. Um, you, can, you can do everything in R just by typing things on the console. So I can work in the console, issue commands, and, and, and do whatever. But even though what you do on the console is saved when you, when you exit in a so-called R history file, you'll, you'll really have to consider this to be volatile information. It goes away. And as I said, R is big and complicated, and you're likely to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. I type something, and then it doesn't work. And then I go back and fix it. And for example, I can, I can say, um, I type 2 times pi here. What I actually wanted to do is pi squared. So I can use my up arrow, retrieve the last command, edit it, and change it to pi squared. <coughs> and thus, I can issue command after command after command. But a much more sensible way to do this is simply type everything you do in a script file and save that script file. The really important thing about that is your, your research, your work becomes reproducible. It's easy to add comments. It's easy to understand later on what you were doing and update yourself. And it's also then much easier to reuse code that you've written f one time for another thing. So my work in R always goes into a script file. I, you know, even, even small and trivial things, um, I, I write into a script file. They have a habit of. Um, not staying small and trivial, but becoming larger and more convoluted and more complicated and becoming a real development, and then a uh, script file is where they would need to go. So let's start with a script file for this day. Um, I have a little template, an R script template that contains a few things that's that are often useful to have in a script file that you develop for some kind of um, a small project. So <clears throat> open this link on the wiki and open a new file on on your RStudio and uh, copy and paste. The, the name of the file on the wiki is R script template. Um, 
and I will name it um, first script.r. Now, strictly speaking, putting this into the first line of your code is completely superfluous because you already you'll know what the name is once you save it. But um, I I find it useful when I when I switch around with many uh, different windows open. Uh, it's often useful to check here, and I can write some purpose. Um, Versions are really useful when you want to do reproducible code. Um, save a backup every now and then, and continue and give it a new version number, date and author, and so on. You can, you can identify um, important metadata about the project that you're working with. Um, for example, you can identify <coughs> the kind of input your project uses, the kind of output it creates, and the kind of dependencies it needs. Dependencies would be data resources, or code resources, or some kind of utilities. Um, usually your scripts are incomplete, they're like poems, always incomplete until you abandon them. Um, so you might have a list of to-do things that you would like to do next, or notes to other people who want to use your script, and so on. So here's the first command um, that we have in here. And um, we can use um, parameters, packages, functions, maybe at a little later time. Right now, um, <coughs> I would just like to have a little space here um, into which I can type things as I go along. Now I'll save this. So make sure when you're saving, you see the extension .r, not .txt. And if you have it that way, you should see green highlight. If all your code looks black, then you might have saved it in .txt. Good point. Okay, now the way that um, probably may be the most productive way um, to work is to copy things from the first steps code file that you want to keep and paste it into your first Hang on, what happened now? And paste it into your first script um, command. And
and this is also where you can type all your notes and, and comments and and things that you want to remember so that your notes and the things that you've done in R are all in the same place. Now this is a this is a command and what this command does it gives me a directory listing of my home directory and without being able to try it David, is that the right way? Okay, so this may or may not work. Um, if you're on Windows, give it a try. And it will find all the files in your home directory, or not, if that's not the right way to specify it, um, that end with the string text. Now, <coughs> I have this in my in my source file, but of course, essentially, what I want to do is I, I need to have this executed in R on the console. So I could take it from the source file and paste it into the console, and then press return, and it tells me um, that this command yields 10 text files in my home directory. But of course that's awkward, always copying and pasting things around. And there's a much more elegant way. And that's if I have my cursor in a line in the script file, and then on the Mac press command return, it automatically gets executed in the console. And I think on Windows I need to press command R. Or you hit the run button in the top of the um, Okay, right, so the tooltip tells me, I've never used this, I just know how to type it. The tooltip tells me this means run the current line or selection. And that thing with the current line or selection is important because it's a convenient way to specify parts of our commands. So for example, these are actually two nested commands. The inside command is this directory command and the outside command is the length. And the length command gives me the number of elements in the vector. So if I want to execute only the inside part, I just select it and then do this. And I get a vector with all my file names in my home directory. <coughs> or I select the whole thing and I get this here. Or I select more than one and I get 10 for my home directory and 0 for this because this directory doesn't exist on my computer. So that's the convenient way to work with our scripts. You type your commands, um, you select them, or you just place the cursor into, into the line, um, you execute them, and then you change things around and re-execute them. So for example, I can change the pattern from .text to .doc, and I see I have one doc file in my, in my home directory. <clears throat> okay, now in the console we can use the up arrow keys and change things and execute them again um, to retrieve and edit previous commands. Um, in the script file you've already got your command listed. Um, you can also use the command source for a particular file name to execute an entire script at once.
So maybe just to make sure that everything works, um, we'll do that. Try the source command. Um, as a task, I would like you to Okay, so I'd like you to create a completely new R script. In that R script, enter just one command, print, open parenthesis, quotation mark, good morning, or time for coffee, or hello world, or whatever, and save this in your project directory under the file name test.r. This is a file which we'll just use to try things and then throw away again. Then you go into your script file, first script.r, and you type the command source test.r. And then you execute that line, source test.r. R will then open the script file, execute all commands it finds in there, so it will greet you with a hearty and heartfelt good morning, and then um, close that file. And maybe we'll change it to time for coffee instead. And when you're done with that, and your source command actually prints time for coffee, you've earned yourself a well-deserved coffee of our first morning break. <laughs>